Okay, so I want to end this section on simulation by pointing out some number of caveats or gotchas you have to worry about. The first one has to do with warm-up. Um, as I've said several times already, uh, simulation variables are going to be somewhat uh, 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 all over the map in the first part of the simulation. So if you, any simulation, there's going to be some amount of highly variable time, and then there's a settling down, and then the variables become fairly fixed. And so this portion needs to be monitored, and typically by just looking at the variable over time, and it's always good to discard the first portion of any simulation, the warmer portion, and uh, where it is needs to be determined. So that's something that you should do as a matter of course. The second thing is that there's always a temptation to sort of uh, chop up a simulation into smaller uh, intervals and use sub-intervals for computing the values of the xi's. So going back to this over here, we can say, well, let's not do multiple runs. We'll use this value as x1, we'll use this as x2, we'll use this as x3, etc. And uh, it looks a perfectly reasonable thing to do and it saves you the time of uh, having to uh, run multiple runs of the simulation. But there is a problem, which is that it could be that there is a correlation between x1 and x2 and x2 and x3 through any kind of memory process. And so chopping up will uh, only work if these value, uh, variables are are known to be IID, independent and identically, dis identically distributed, because if they aren't, then any of the measures for computing Xn bar, uh, the expected value of Xn bar is not going to be equal to mu. What you're going to get from the, uh, the uh, sample mean uh, is going to be perhaps quite far away from the true mean, and so it's very important that uh, you do multiple runs uh, with, uh, with different random variables rather than chopping up a simulation. And if you do chop up the simulation, then it's important that these periods are chosen to be quite long rather than very short ones so that uh, any kind of correlation structure is going to be mitigated because the period over which you're measuring these are long enough. So that's something to be uh, careful about. The third thing is that uh, most of the queuing theoretic analysis assumes that inputs are Poisson, for example. And of course, that's not going to be true. Uh, in a simulation, we can have the inputs be arbitrary. They not, need not be Poisson. So a common mistake is to uh, assume or actually simulate using Poisson inputs even though that's not strictly necessary. You could have a general, any input you want to simulation, so don't restrict yourself to Poisson. However, if you use measurements, then there is a problem with there as well. So if you use measurements to uh, uh, drive the simulation, then you have to be careful that the measurements come from an open system rather than a closed system. And so to explain what this means, uh, imagine that I am looking at the arrivals to a queue, and here's a queue, and there's a server over here, and I'm looking at the arrival process, and I'm measuring it by putting in a measurement counter over here. So uh, what happens is that when the customer enters the queue, uh, they're going to be in the queue, and while they're in the queue, uh, they're not going to be available for entering in the queue again. So to imagine this is a grocery store in a small town, and let's say there are you know only 20 people in this town so if the or there are five people waiting over here then the arrival rate over here is going to be lower than if there are no people waiting over here and in fact if there are 15 people waiting over here there's only five people left in town to come back and be uh, coming into the queue possibly and so the arrival rate is going to decrease and of course if there are 20 people all waiting in the grocery store the arrival rate goes down to zero so the arrival rate is coupled to the arrival rate is therefore in this case is coupled to the queue occupancy and this is characteristic of what's called a closed system and in a specific uh, uh, definition of a closed system is that essentially the total number of customers is finite and that's really what the problem is over here now of course 
we always have a finite number of customers, but if the number of customers is you know, 20 million and not 20, the fact that there are 20 in the queue shouldn't really affect the arrival rate at all. So we can say that the arrival rate is approximately independent of queue occupancy. And so uh, in that case, we have an open system. So if you're going to do measurements from a closed system, and then we use those measurements to drive a different simulation, for example, a different service discipline in the grocery store, then the problem is that we are going from a, one closed system to another closed system, and that's really bad. That shouldn't happen. What we really need to do is to make sure that you go from an open system to the simulated system, and not from a closed system to a simulated system when we are trying to look at uh, arrivals. Uh, a particularly insidious case of this is when we don't have a grocery store. Let's say that in fact this is a queue in a, in a router and what we have is we're looking at packet arrivals and these packet arrivals are coming from a process such as a TCP client over here. And if a TCP client is sending packets into the router, the number of packets from this client is restricted by the fact that they need to get acknowledgements back. So if no acknowledgements come back due to packet losses, the TCP client is going to shut up and there'll be no more arrivals anymore. And so the measurements that you're taking at this point in the system, these measurements over here for the client arrival rates are from a closed system, not from an open system. And so if you take these arrivals and use them to drive a simulated system, you're making essentially a huge error because what you're going to get is not particularly reasonable at all. So uh, that's something to be careful about. And then finally, any code you write is, may have bugs in it. So it's very important to validate a simulator. And the, for example, if you're simulating a queuing network, then try out an MM1 queue and make sure that the parameters that uh, you are measuring, uh, such as the uh, uh, utilization or the mean queuing delay, match the theoretical results. If you cannot get the theory and the measurements to match for a simple queue, then obviously it's not going to work for anything else either. So uh, to sum up, when doing simulations, be careful to do warm up. Uh, be careful if you're going to chop up a long trace into some of the sm smaller pieces, you're probably better off using different random numbers, especially with the antithetic variables. Uh, be careful not to just use Poisson inputs. You can use general inputs, so don't be tied down to Poisson. Uh, make sure that you're doing measurement-driven uh, trace simulations. Uh, then you should use measurements from an open system, not from a closed system. And finally, do validate your simulator for known inputs so that you can be sure that you're doing the right thing.